today is Saturday, April 10th, 1999. We are at the Museum of Appalachia near Norris, Tennessee, interviewing the museum's founder and director, John Rice Erwin. John Rice, we're glad to be in this beautiful spot this morning. What what would you like to point out as one of the most interesting features here at your museum? You should have told me you were going to ask me a hard question like that. <laughs> that that's sort of like asking an old uh, uh, grandmother which one of her grandchildren uh, is her favorite, you know. Every time I get something in, for a while it tends to be a favorite. I suppose if you had to talk in general terms, in the beginning I had uh, all of the items uh, it was on display or exhibits and things of this sort. And then I had the gardens, the vegetable gardens, and the uh, the animals mainly to, for utilitarian purposes, you know, to make a living off of. And I noticed people began to to uh, notice. You hear the peafowl down there now, uh, and and pay a lot of attention to the outside, the pastoral, the sheep and the goats and the Scottish cattle and the gardens and all the different uh, herbs and plants and uh, and those kind of things. And so I've emphasized that more, and I guess that uh, that the outside and all of the uh, things that go with uh, the yards and the flowers and the shrubbery and the uh, fruit trees and all this are just as uh, appealing. So, and it, it used to irritate me a little bit because I spent all my time uh, putting things uh, on display and writing up the, uh, the captains and all, and then people would stand out and look at the peas going, you know. <laughs> but we still, the, the second, I guess, would be the Hall of Fame. Uh, we have some people who come and spend an entire day in the Hall of Fame and look at the the items as they relate to people. That's the whole, I think, difference in this museum than, than others, because I have emphasized the people and not the object. And, and nearly all the museums that I know uh, do the opposite. They emphasize the object never tell you much about where it came from, who it belonged to, who made it, mended it, cared for it, and passed it on, you know. How did you choose people to be honored in the museum? How did you select them? I have a, uh, uh, a committee that I spent a lot of time uh, selecting, and that committee consists of one person, and you can guess who that one person is. I make no pretense of uh, having people included in the museum in any order of importance. What I try to explain is that I try to have uh, people who represent the the, uh, the statesmen of the region, someone to represent the honesty or the integrity and all of like that. So I just uh, mainly, if I were totally honest, it depended on uh, who I could uh, get items from. In other words, if I, uh, you know, that's not very grammatically correct, but uh, if I can find things that uh, belong to uh, Estes Kefauver, uh I would, uh, and I do have some things from him, or, or Howard Baker, and I have Howard Baker in there. I heard him on that he was appointed to some national committee now, considered to be one of the better, uh, more statesman type persons, I guess, in the country. But it depends on, on that, uh, and also the availability of the person to talk with, or if the person is not living, depends on how much information I can get from them. So there's no possible way that I ever would claim to have uh, all or the most important early musicians represented. But the, the, the musicians that I do have represented uh, are good representatives of their particular era and uh, type of music, I guess. So the Hall of Fame sort of represents <laughs> the heart of the people, just as the objects that you have in the cabins and houses scattered around represent the heart of the people who lived in this Appalachian area? Yes. Um, I have, for example, uh, from your... 
Am I going to have to compete with that? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Little I have, for example, a, a little uh, pair, they call them pair, of nooks that, was, that uh, are made of wood. And uh, they were made by Polk Irwin, and uh, he left here when he was 14 years old going to uh, Illinois to work. And uh, he couldn't afford to buy brass nuts to protect himself, but he, he made, uh, uh, took a piece of wood and made a hole, made holes for his fingers. So when he made a fist, that uh, piece of wood would be out here. That would not be so effective until he drove a little nail in each one and let the nail stick out about a quarter of an inch. So he had the most effective pair of nuts. Now, I, uh, that kind of thing interests me because uh, it belonged to your father. I mean, he, he got it from Polk and he was good enough, Will G. Lenore, to uh, let me have it, sell it to me, or trade with, with me, I guess. Then I have uh, Polk as an exhibit, uh, in the exhibit there. Uh, he was <coughs> represented the kind of people that left here as almost a child. He was not only was only 14 years old, he was very small for his age. He worked out there for many years and uh, saved his money. And then, even though he worked 10 or 12, 10 hours a day or so on the farm and got paid for it, he went home and worked for this old lady with whom he stayed and did her chores and had, paid, had to pay no rent or no food uh, cost. So he saved virtually everything he made eventually came back and bought part of his father's farm out here and then more of it and owned uh, after a while uh, I guess a few hundred acres and then this ties in with TVA he uh, started to pay attention to the what the TVA recommended and one of the purposes of TVA was to recommend better farming practices uh, better fertilized for the crops, and his farm became what they called an experimental farm. So the Tennessee Valley Authority brought people from all over the world. Every once in a while in the paper, you'd see all the people out at Polk Farm, the Indians and uh, Pakistanians and people from the third world countries who would come there to, to look at what this uh, fellow who'd, who had no education, but who uh, had uh, made a success and had utilized the assistance that was provided to him. Um, and I guess it all, the reason I have him in that, one of the reasons is because I started out with those, that little pair of nuts, which tells the whole story. And But I later on got a lot of other things, the single tree that he used to plow his corn with uh, that hooked to the plow. So those are the cri kind of criteria, as I say, to be repetitive. Uh, claim, make no claim to have all the important uh, farmers or musicians or politicians or statesmen or whatever included, but those who are included are good examples of uh, their particular uh, group of people whom they represent. And the other thing I've tried to do is to not get overbalanced with uh, just celebrities. Uh, I have uh, many people there that nobody ever heard of. Uh, a lady by the name of uh, Worthington, and I have a list of the, um, she had, uh, I guess her, her later children made this list of the children who were born, and the first nine children that she had died in either infancy or in early, in the early years. But uh, to me, it, it, it says a lot and should be inspirational to the people. These, how could this lady uh, have that many children and hold up and and continue on? And and you could imagine the apprehension after the, when the tenth child was born, the fact that all the others had had passed on. But she eventually had uh, two or three who survived, and from those, uh, many other many of the people in this county are descended. You often read and hear about out-migration, and we had out-migration in this region as much as anywhere in the country, I guess, because as, as early as the 1830s, um, all the land was pretty much taken up. And the main crop, more important by far than all other crops put together, was corn, 
Indian maize, and it it, uh, it is not a high yielding crop. In fact, uh, uh, the yield got down to 25 bushel an acre. So, and all of the land was cleared, and because uh, in order to plant the corn, and then it uh, tended eventually it was washed away, totally washed away. So, so many of the, of the uh, not all of the uh, aggressive and um, forward-looking people left, but an awful lot of them did over a period of years. And it's not uncommon to find uh, an old established family here who have, uh, where all of the descendants, virtually all of them, migrated first into Missouri and Kansas and then into Texas and then on the west coast and then to the northwest. But the TVA tended to reverse that and uh, it came about, as you know, during the Depression, and they were able to and succeeded in uh, enticing some of the, of the best minds, the best young men from uh, Kansas and Nebraska and Illinois and uh, Pennsylvania and upstate New York and everywhere else to come in here, and that, uh, that I think was very important because, first of all, uh, the, uh, it tended to counterbalance uh, the out-migration, I suppose. And then the things that TVA, the second part of your question was about the uh, importance of, of, the, of electricity. Electricity, hydroelectric power, I think, was only one of five or six purposes of TVA. But uh, you can talk and... <laughs> How can I compete with that? <laughs> you can lying. talk with uh, you can talk in generalities about uh, electricity, and you can quote statistics and and uh, economic improvement and all like that. But when you uh, boil it down to the to the basics, what it meant for us, for example, when we had before we had a refrigerator in the summertime, if you had butter. We, I remember my mother would take this, uh, would take a big uh, bowl and fill it full of cool water, and then she'd set another bowl inside of it uh, that contained the butter. Well, after uh, two or three hours, the water on the outside in the main bowl was just as warm as uh, as the butter, and we'd have to go and, and change it every two or three hours all day just to, just to preserve the butter. Otherwise, it would be, it would melt. Uh, <coughs> Why don't you run him, run him off of there? Throw a stick of wood at him or something. Get rid of him, get that out of the way a little bit. Shoot him out of there, Sam. So every two, you know, to keep the butter, you had to change the water all the time. Yeah, and and uh, even so, the butter would only it would it would start tasting uh, stale after a couple. of two or three days. Uh, same way with milk. Uh, milk would barely last uh, one day. You know, it would start blinking and souring and clabbering. And of course, people learned to, my grandfather liked clabbered milk after it became sort of a jello-like uh, semi-solid. But uh, if, you, if you think of it from that standpoint, then it really has important, an important meaning. The uh, meat, for example, would only probably wouldn't well it wouldn't last a day you know in, in real hot weather so just that simple little thing the refrigerator uh, meant so very much and then the other thing was the was the lights people at that time and some people today instead of talking about their electric bill they talk about the light bill because that one little light bulb that was hanging in the middle of a room uh, just totally changed everything because before that, you had the uh, kerosene or coal oil lamps, and every night you'd have to, uh, uh, of a morning maybe, uh, trim the wicks because they, they needed to be straight across. And then uh, when you were uh, using them of a night, trying to read by them, it was a very, very difficult straining on the eye. And uh, then if you turned the uh, wick up a little too much, you blackened the globe. And, You'd have to turn it out completely and go clean the globe and so forth. 
so the uh, the electric light bulb just was a uh, incredibly important feature of the hydroelectric power and um, it uh, it just changed people's the whole way of life almost well of course the the town of Nart was uh, people are always saying that it's somewhat unique I guess it's either unique or it isn't unique they say but certainly Nart uh, was unique uh, in that it was a town that was built almost overnight for the purpose mainly I guess of housing those people who work for TVA so for a long time um, I guess there was not a, a, a problem of getting along or anything but the people in Norris uh, tended to go their own ways because they had jobs and they would go to their <clears throat> respective jobs and come back and there wasn't an awful lot of interaction as I remember in the beginning uh, and <clears throat> the same thing with the people in the uh, rural areas uh, did not. Sam, you're in charge, Jim. <laughs> it was it was different, and and I can say uh, truthfully that I never uh, remember any uh, any animos animosity. I think that uh, there was always a little bit of feeling of inferiority on the part of the people uh, out in the farming area because most of the ones who, uh, most of us uh, were families that had never been to college or anything and uh, most of the people there were uh, college graduates. But later on, over a period of years, they began to become more amalgamated, intermarriage, and uh, there was uh, some people who, I guess, made a special effort. David Lillianthal, I may have mentioned this before, uh, would get out in the countryside and, and ride his horse and stop and watch people kill hogs and talk to the farmers and all. But generally, it, uh, it was a part, and again, I would stress, I remember no uh, criticism or animosity between the two, the two groups. We went to, um, when I first started the high school there in 1945, there was um, always reference made to the uh, county, the county kids <clears throat> and the Norris kids, you know. And there even at that point tended to be a separation. There was a consciousness always that you were a Norris from a Norris kid or a county kid, you know. Sort of like the rich kids and the and the the poor kids. Yeah, it was, and, and again, there was no um, you know no hatred or no bitterness, no fights or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. But just that feeling there, and uh, that later uh, over a period of time began to um, disappear. I uh, was. Uh, elected uh, president of student council mainly by the people from Norris so by that time we were uh, you know it was just it, it was more of a feeling of uh, camaraderie and and school spirit than there was those two groups see. I would probably I would guess that uh, half of the people that, who are living in Norris now are uh, from outside the area one way or another either either uh, the both members of the family, both husband and wife, or at least the husband or wife, especially with the addition of uh, several of the subdivisions there. But uh, the, we were talking about the, um, the, the advantage, uh, the change that was wrought by TVA, and this may not fit in precisely with regard to what we're talking about, but one of the important things, I think, was that it, uh, the, the TVA and especially the building of Norris Dam, the largest concrete dam in the whole world, and, uh, and built without all of the, the equipment that we have today was just a total uh, wonder. And I think it was built ahead of schedule and this kind of thing. <coughs> but it, uh, it created so many jobs. Now, I'm, I'm always one that opposes any kind of, uh, well, i put it another way, I would never justify, <coughs> or try to justify 
in a project just because it creates jobs. Now they do this all the time when they started to build the Clinch River Breeder Reactor. They kept never telling about what it was going to do for people, how good it was going to be, but how many jobs it was going to create. Well, if you re uh, reduce that to its simplest terms, you go out and dig a hole in the ground, which they did, 500 feet deep and three mile long, and create jobs. But it's a waste of manpower, you know. But in the case of Norris Dam, it did both. It was a good thing and it created jobs. I don't know whether I mentioned this or not, but this is a little story that is so sad and yet humorous uh, about the people who would come to Norris Dam. Did I talk about this the last time? I don't work? think so. And um, they, there was a group of people, of men, about that lived seven miles from here, and they would walk, get up at whatever, four o'clock in the morning, and walk over here to work on the dam all day. And then uh, after work hours, they'd walk those seven miles back home. And one night they got over there and the first fella lived in a little uh, two-room renter's house. And they, he went in and the other men sat down outside to rest. And they knew the old man, they called him an old man, was so tired that he probably just went in and flopped down and went sound to sleep. They sat there 10 or 15 minutes. And one of them yelled, uh, at the, that the old man in the house said, Jake, it's time to go to work. And he jumps up, grabs his empty uh, uh, dinner bucket and, and run out and was ready to start back those uh, seven miles. Uh, so it, uh, and, and they, they thought it was a great privilege and it was. Farm laborers at the time were getting for 10 to 12 hours a day, 75 cents a day. Parenthetically, you could buy uh, probably two frying chickens. Today a person can work, and I figured out the other day based on what they're asking, uh, what, the, what they're selling for in the store, a person can buy 50 times as many frying chickens <coughs> for a day's labor as they could at that time. And the eggs were selling for 35 or 40 cents a dozen around uh, about that time. So these, they, it created uh, the jobs and it created a sense of, uh, of dignity, the fact that uh, these people were working, working on something important. And you can imagine how the difference in, in a person's uh, self-esteem. Say, what are you doing? Well, I'm raising a little corn, a little tobacco, and not being able to send his kids to even elementary school. And then, all of a sudden, he can say, I'm working on Norris Dam, you know. or with all the related activities that TVA had, all of their experimental uh, stations and all the, uh, the land that adjoined uh, the, uh, and the building of the town of Norris and all that. 